Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our channel. Welcome to the Hillbilly Files. I am Leo, and I will be your humble host today. Uh, I am headed way up on top of a mountain here to uh, to tell you guys a really cool story. And I figured I'd, I was on the way up. I just happened to see these two lovely young ladies. There's one right there and one right there. And I figured we'd stop and just say hello to them real quick as we're passing by. Hi, girls. How y'all today? <laughs> you okay? Oh, there goes them tails. <laughs> now you know why they're called white tail deer, don't you? See how them tails poof up? Both of them. They got them tails poofed. They go to run, they'll raise them tails up. <laughs> anyway, like I said, I just thought I'd stop here, saw the girls, and thought I'd show them to you guys. But we're headed on up here. Girls, we'll see y'all later. Thank y'all for being on the show. And we appreciate y'all. See y'all later. <laughs> All right, let's get on up the mountain. in the road one two three four five way intersection right here that one goes to mate one this one goes out to the playground loops back around and comes back out right there that one goes down into town or down back down into the road i should say but this goes on up to the playground <laughs> the place that i named these are pretty good trails right here. This one's just been redone. They put in a new gas wheel, or gas line, and redid the trail recently. So this one's pretty fast. You can move a little bit, you know, pick up some speed. The one we're gonna have to get onto in a little while is extremely rocky. And he's four wheel drive territory. This is two. I'm in two wheel drive right now. interesting rock layers through here I bet you there's all kinds of fossils right here I've never checked this little spot but it looks like very promising places may have to come back up do another fossil video and there's a coal seam in case anybody's curious that's what coal looks like when it's in the ground you can see the big seam going right up through there wheel line on this side usually anytime you have coal or oil in an area you will typically have natural gas as well I guess it's about that time isn't it we've looked at the beautiful scenery and rode the trails and had us a good old time so i guess now it's time to tell you the story we actually came here to tell huh today we are at one of my favorite places i just think it looks close to 
what it was once like here, you know, no roads or power lines and just nature at its best. Uh, I, I guess I just kind of felt like it'd be a, a fitting place to tell this story. It's uh, a little bit of a strange story, but also one I think some of us can probably relate to. It takes place in Tennessee, and ironically, I seem to be a distant relative once we looked into it. Uh, most of the families in you know the time period we tend to focus on came through Virginia, Massachusetts, or New York. So being, you know, related to someone way back then isn't quite as unusual as some may think. As a matter of fact, Heather recently found a Mary Ingalls in her family tree as a grandmother. After some research, she found out that she's also a distant relative of Charles and Laura Ingalls from Little House on the Prairie. And it can be really strange, guys, to find out that you are related to all sorts of historic characters and had no idea. Princess Diana, John Wilkes Booth, and no less than four royals laying in state across Europe as we speak right now have all turned up in my family tree. Now, you, you just imagine that, guys. We're, we're talking about a royal hillbilly, okay? <laughs> that's, that's got to be, that has got to be just the craziest thing you guys will hear today. I, I, I honestly think you should all subscribe just for that one thing alone. You know? <laughs> so anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, this story is about the six Walker sisters. Now, there are several books written about them, but honestly, they, they weren't really on our radar until a viewer sent us a suggestion as a story, and we started doing some research on them. Unfortunately, we can't just load up and go to Tennessee today, but we still can tell you about these amazing people and this place would be hard to beat in any state. First of all, we tried to pin down exactly how I'm related, but it turned out to be too extensive of a search and with too many of the same names, you know, recycled over and over again. But to give you the gist of it, my sixth grandfather is a man named John Rutherford Walker. He died in Greene County, Tennessee, in 1796 and the family line carries on from there it goes to me through his daughter margaret peg walker who married jacob blair which is my mother's maiden name so anyway let's begin their incredible story is one of strength hard work and love for their family home in the Great Smoky Mountains. Now, we're not quite on the Great Smoky Mountains. I did a little compass. It's about 120, so we're right about, right about there where that antenna is, is right down this way is where we're talking about. With the, with the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, hundreds of families were asked to move out of their mountain homes. Some went willingly, and others fought against it, but most families moved more or less immediately. A select few, including our six unmarried Walker sisters, received a very special lifetime lease, a chance to live out the rest of their lives in the log cabin that they were raised in. Even after the land it had, the land that it sat on was turned into a national park. The father's, the sister's father, John Walker, married Margaret Jane King in 1866 after returning for home from the Civil War, where he fought for the Union and was actually imprisoned by the Confederacy for a while. After marrying, 
John Walker obtained a house and property in Little Greenbrier Cove through Margaret's family, later expanding his land by buying out her brother and her sister. The house was made of logs from tulip poplars and insulated with mud and rocks. Poplar was and is still a popular wood because it's straight and has few bends or knots. And it was used in, you know, mostly used in cabin construction, the best cabins anyway. Also, poplar was used as mine props in coal mines back in the day. The very poplar, poplar wood, <laughs> it tends to pop and crack before it breaks, giving coal miners an extra layer of warning, in theory. Poplar, 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 poplar. I, sorry, guys, I just thought I'd say that a few more times. Uh, <laughs> other buildings on the Walker property included a barn, a corn crib, a smokehouse, a pig pen, an apple barn, and a blacksmith shop. A spring house built over a nearby flowing creek kept dairy products like milk and butter cool year-round and provide storage for pickled vegetables. A very innovative man, uh, John crafted ladder-back chairs, looms, tools, and even a small cotton gin of his very own. He also planted orchards that included more than 20 different kinds of apple trees, as well as peaches, cherries, and plums. Chicken, sheep, goats, and hogs were also raised on the family farm. There are seven Walker sisters. From left to right uh, is in the front, from left to right, is Margaret, Louisa, and Polly. In the back, left to right, is Hetty, Martha, Nancy, and Caroline. And this photo was taken by Jim Shelton in 1909. A family of 13 altogether. The Walkers raised 11 children seven girls and four boys. All 11 children reached maturity and given the time period and its lack of medical care, this was obviously, you know, an extremely rare case. Uh, anyway, in 1881, John Walker and his son, James Thomas, helped build a small log schoolhouse at the center of the growing Little Greenbrier community. It would also double as a primitive Baptist church until 1925. Because there was so much work to do on the farm during the warm season, school classes were held in the winter for two or three months at a time. School back then was a privilege that was appreciated much more than it is today and not everyone got the chance to go to school, even if they wanted to. It was a chance for the children to learn, to see their friends, and to escape their daily chores for a little while. The lessons included spelling, arithmetic, reading, and writing. The Walker boys all married and left home, while only one of the seven sisters, Sarah Caroline, got married. The other six unmarried sisters stayed in Little Greenbrier with their father and inherited the family farm after his death in 1921. He was 80 years old. One of the sisters, Nancy, died 10 years later, and the remaining five sisters began to establish their life on the farm. They fed and clothed themselves. They raised livestock and maintained their mountain homestead for over 40 years. The five sisters did all of the farm and housework themselves for more than 40 years, guys. A typical meal at the Walker house 
would almost always include pork and corn. Their garden also provided them with fresh vegetables in the growing season. For winter time, ham, bacon, and salt pork was cured in the smokehouse. The sisters were also excellent spinners and weavers. Wool from their sheep was cleaned and spun using their spinning wheel, sometimes dyeing the yarn with colored berries or bark. From there, they simply wove the yarn into any shape fabric that they needed. Flax and cotton were also grown at the Walker sisters farm to produce their own textiles using the cotton gin that their father had built. Following in their mother's footsteps, the daughters also kept a herb garden for mountain remedies, including horseradish, bone set, and peppermint for healing teas. Natural plants in the forest were collected and cultivated as well. The Walker sisters once said, our land provides everything we need except sugar, baking soda, coffee, and salt. <laughs> In 1926, Congress approved authorization of the park, allowing North Carolina and Tennessee to start raising money to buy nearly half a million acres, most of which was privately owned. Parcels of land collected from families and timber companies alike were bargained for, haggled over, and eventually purchased including the Walker Sisters' 122-acre homestead. Refusing to leave their mountain home, the sisters held out until 1940 when President Roosevelt officially dedicated the Great Smoky Mountain National Park from a stone memorial at Newfound Gap. With the creation of the park, the sisters received $4,750 for their land, as well as the opportunity to live out the remainder of their lives at their family home through a lifetime lease. But living in a national park meant some changes would need to take place. Traditional practices like hunting and fishing, cutting wood, grazing livestock, things like that, were now prohibited within the park. So a new lifestyle had to, be, had to be developed by the sisters. Visitors flocked to the park and visited what became known as Five Sisters Cove. The walkers welcomed the curious newcomers and saw them as an opportunity to sell handmade items such as children's toys, crocheted dollies, fried apple pies, and even Louisa's handwritten poems. The sisters were even featured in the Saturday Evening Post in April in 1946, showcasing their mountain lifestyle to the rest of the world. The year before the post writer visited the homestead, Polly passed away. Hetty died a year later in 1947, and Martha died in 1951. With only two sisters left, Margaret and Louisa wrote a letter to the park superintendent asking if the visitor's welcome sign with information about the Walker sisters could be taken down, explaining that they were getting too old and too tired to get work on the farm done and greet visitors too. At the time, Margaret was 82 and Louisa was 70. Margaret Walker died in 1962 at the age of 92. And Louisa stayed in the house until she died on July 13, 1964. The last sister, Caroline, the one who had moved away and married, passed away in 1966. Though the Walker sisters are now gone, their legacy lives on through their homestead, the objects they created and lived with, and the neighbors and visitors they interacted with well into the 1950s. By parking at Metcalf Bottoms, 
you can take the short half mile walk up to the Little Greenbrier Schoolhouse, which John Walker and his son helped build. If you're up for a little more, take the Little Greenbrier Gap Trail a mile up to the Walker Sisters' beloved homestead. Stand on the porch and imagine what life was like for the five sisters when they trapped food in the forest, tended to their gardens and livestock, and openly welcomed visitors before and after the park was established. Unfortunately, visitors will not be greeted with fried apple pies anymore, but instead by a reminiscent, peaceful atmosphere that surrounds the vacant Walker homestead. They are buried in a Tennessee cemetery with headstones that all read, Sister. In the same place, their parents are buried, at rest together forever physically and spiritually. I hope that they are a family again in heaven. Rest in peace, Walker family. I wish more people valued family the way you guys did. It just seems to be, it seems to be a lost art in today's modern world, you know? an amazing story is it not and such an amazingly beautiful place figured I'd just stop for a second and let some of y'all soak some of that up just a little bit spectacular isn't it Anyway, guys, thank you all for coming along. We very much appreciate you guys for joining us on this edition of the Hillbilly Files. And I certainly hope you enjoyed our video. Hope you enjoyed some of the beautiful, beautiful scenery and the beautiful weather today, too. And anyway, you guys, y'all have a really good day. God bless you. And we'll see you next time on the Hillbilly Files. Leo out.